one and all. Very sorry for that. Thank you, David. Thanks, everyone, for um, joining. Uh, good to be with you. And um, today's subject, I'd like to probably just deal with the astrotheology today <clears throat> because um, I have a flu and I'm not well <laughs> and my nose is all stuffy. So I've already done three hours of radio today. So um, I might just stick with one subject. It might be easier to handle. I should be right. <laughs> but um, I'd like to deal with the... Um, the season of December and uh, the sign of Capricorn. Capricorn is the most exciting season for astrotheology. Starting from the 21st of December, which is the solstice, and through to about, um, well, I would say through into Aquarius on the 25th of January, all of that month is the best time for astrotheology. So these days, as you get around in the um, in the shopping malls and uh, everywhere you go, you see these beautiful <coughs> nativity scenes. Now, of course, uh, most people believe that this was an, actu an actual historical event, a real event. So they they um, treat the nativity scene as a physical, real event that occurred sometime in history. You see? So uh, what I'd like to do is just go through some of the um, alignments that you're going to be seeing in the next two months. In two months, the next two months, at midnight, between midnight and two o'clock, what you will see in the skies is the, um, the actual true nativity scene unfolding in the sky. And what you will see in the sky uh, <coughs> is all of the characters and all of the symbols that are in the nativity scene. For instance, there is always a manger. There are always animals in the manger. There is always Mary with her newborn son. There is always a star above the manger or above the head of Mary. There will always be shepherds outdoors with their flocks and there will always be three wise men that come along with their uh, gold and frankincense and myrrh. You see, so it's very interesting that these are the usual characters that turn up in the nativity scene. What does it all mean? Well, what I'm going to do today is um, I've got my little whiteboard. There's my little whiteboard. And um, what I would like to do is um, show the graphs of the coming alignments so that um, for the next two months, if you care to, uh, starting at uh, the hour of midnight, you can go out and you can spot all of these stars. Uh, they're easy to find. Very easy to find. And so, um, Even even an amateur astronomer can find these stars. But I would like to preface the um, discussion with some scientific uh, uh, and some um, some real facts, so that you know you will know how to uh, find these stars. For those of you living in the northern hemisphere, um, when you look for the zodiacal signs of the zo uh, of the um, the arc of the zodiac, uh, you must face southward. So you, you, from the northern hemisphere you must face southward and you can see the stars above you and going toward the south. Whereas in Australia, we need to uh, face the north. 
So when you, you, you go out to see these beautiful stars that I'm going to show you, if you're in Australia, just face northward and you'll see Virgo on your right and you will go across the whole arc of the sky and Aries will be setting in the west. Now, for people in Canada and um, the Northern Hemisphere, uh, what you need to do is face southward and you will see um, rather than Virgo rising on the right and Aries uh, setting in the west, what you will see is uh, Virgo um, in the east on your left hand side, not your right hand side. Okay, so that's that's all I wanted to say about that because many people struggle with the constellations and they write to me and say, oh, I can't find the constellation. And so I have to tell them that if you're in the north, to see the zodiacal signs, you must face southward. And, of course, your east will be to your left and your west will be to your right. Now we in Australia, we face northward and our east is to our right. In fact, I'm pointing to the east right now from my house because I am facing my computer, I'm facing north. Okay? So I look over there to the east and I see Virgo rising. Then I see Leo. I see Cancer. Then I see... Gemini, Taurus, and Aries. And they are the uh, beautiful summer constellations. The sun is in those signs in the summertime. Now, you guys in, in Canada and Great Britain, <coughs> in the Northern Hemisphere, you're going to go out for the next two months to see these beautiful stars and you're going to look to the left in, to the east and you'll see Virgo rising at midnight between midnight and 2 2 a.m. and then of course you'll see the Leo um, Cancer Gemini Taurus and um, Aries will be setting to your right. Okay? So that's cleared all that up. Just one more thing about that. Um, in, in the Northern Hemisphere, those six constellations come, come up almost above your head. They come up very high. These, are very, these six are very, very high. You see, in the winter you can see them in December, January, February, and Aries and Taurus, and they, they go directly above your head. They're very, very high, these stars. Whereas the constellations from Libra to Pisces, they are very low in your sky, in the Northern Hemisphere, the winter constellations, which you see in summer. They are about 35 degrees above the horizon. Okay? Now, in Australia, that's opposite. When I go out and look north and I try and find the constellations of the zodiac, and in particular the ones from Aries to Virgo, they are very low in the sky. Taurus only, at where I am at my latitude in Melbourne, Taurus is like probably only about 30 degrees above the horizon. You see? But the other six constellations, from Libra uh, to um, Pisces, they go straight over my head in Australia. And so Scorpio, he goes straight over my head. Whereas in the Northern Hemisphere, you always see Scorpio very low. Okay. I think I've laboured that point. Uh, but it's very, very important to preface that with... Um, just some factual know-how 
so that you don't go out and just look anywhere for these constellations if you're not familiar with them already. Now, the most recognisable of these signs would be would have to be the fixed ones, uh, Taurus and Leo. Cancer is not very recognisable. Gemini is, it's beautiful twin stars, they look like twins. And that's about it. Leo, Taurus and Gemini are really the only outstanding constellations in this sector. So for Taurus you need to look for a V. It looks a little bit like this. Uh, Taurus looks like So, uh, Taurus, excuse me, I want to get maximum. Uh, Taurus looks something like this. and then you have the Pleiades over there. These, these are the high 80s. The high 80s. And these are the beautiful uh, Pleiades. Um, <coughs> and the Pleiades correspond to what the Japanese call Subaru. And I'm just trying to find that quickly. No, nope. I thought I had that with me, but I have not. Never mind. So if you look at the, the car symbol for Subaru, the car logo, you'll see six stars. Okay? You won't see seven. These are supposed to be seven sisters. So, um, but but what, what you will notice is that Sorry, I've done this wrong. Um, you, you draw a line almost from the, the bull's... The, the, this is the bullseye, by the way. This is a red star called Aldebaran, one of four stars in the sky. Okay? And um, you draw a line like this and you'll see two, two bright stars up here and that's basically the horns of Taurus. All right? And the Pleiades are very near. Uh, so look for that because that's the that's the brightest star, and right next to it, uh, right next to it, of course, is Orion. And Orion, of course, looks like, like um, in the northern hemisphere. Of course, it's three stars like that, and pretty much like this, and then it's got a little belt like that, and there's a star there, star there, and a star there, and a star there. And one of the stars, of course, uh, Betelgeuse, I think it might be, um, anyway, look, don't, it's, it's one of these four stars. That's what uh, Orion looks like, okay? And Orion is killing the bull. You look, you look for those. And in particular, I'm going to be discussing these three stars here, these three. And they point to Sirius, which is like the brightest star in the sky, bright and blue, and it's almost directly pointing to Sirius, but it's about eight degrees skew if. Okay, so that's all I wanted to um, all I wanted to discuss: how to find the stars, how to find these particular stars, and uh, to look for Taurus and Orion. Okay, so let's discuss the nativity scene, shall we? And I'll just have to <laughs> tend to my flu. Now, I was going to originally just do this without the board, but um, I think <coughs> it might be more beneficial to do it with the board. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with my, um, my sine wave, the sine wave of creation, um, well and good, but for those who are not, I'd like to just go through that just quickly. And 
this is what we have. Okay, so we have a. There's the Earth, <laughs> and uh, that's the equator. It's very hard to do this from such an angle. Um, there are the tropics, and of course the sine wave does that. All right. So. Is everybody happy with that? Um, is everybody sort of um, can see that? And uh, I hope I'm going at a good pace here. Now, excellent. So here, uh, this is the this is the um, the equator, and these are the tropics. So what's happening now is the sun is here. Uh, in, uh, in, in sort of in Sagittarius around this area here and once it hits the 21st of December that's the solstice, the lowest point okay and um, what happens then is that uh, the Sun will be that will be the shortest day of the year officially okay now so let's draw a line down there and here we have the signs of Libra and here is Scorpio so Libra, Scorpio and Sagittarius and um, <coughs> these are the fall months you see the Sun has been falling through to winter and finally when it reaches here um, in the solstice this is the exciting season of Capricorn here now Cap Capricorn um, when the Sun is in Capricorn we see all of these stars when we go out at midnight because of course the Sun is below our feet at midnight the Sun is directly below your feet so when you look up you're going to see all of the beautiful summer signs so what you'll see is um, uh, and by the way uh, you guys in the um, in the northern hemisphere, you're going to see the opposite of of this. You rather than um, rather than Virgo being here, Virgo, Virgo will be over here. Okay. So for people in the southern hemisphere, this graph that I'm doing, the graph that I always do, is perfect. <laughs> it's absolutely perfect for you. Um, but for people in the northern hemisphere, unfortunately, they have to flip this around. Okay, so they will look for, they will look left, they will look left to the east, facing south. They will look left, and they will see Virgo coming up in the east. There, see, we look right. I always look to my right, and there at the horizon, there's Virgo coming up. All right. So now, and Aries is over here. And of course, Taurus is here, and these are the beautiful stars that have the belt of Orion, the three stars, you see, and they point to Sirius, and Sirius is always here, in Canis Major, of Gemini. So Sirius is always above. All right. Now, <coughs> we're here at this point. And when we reach this point next week, uh, the solstice, we wait three days until the 25th, Christmas Day, because what happens on the horizon is very interesting. Between these two days, there is no movement of the sun. Okay? Or should I say the 24th of December, Christmas Eve, midnight. From the 21st, midnight, to the 24th midnight, that's three days. And in those three days, there is no movement on the horizon. You see, if you watch the sun setting on the horizon, it goes like, it travels 47 degrees from solstice to solstice. And it takes six months, stops, 
for three days appears to stop. It's just an appearance. And then it travels back to the other solstice. Goes through the equinox where it also stops for three days. And then it goes to the solstice. Stops for three days. And these are the, these are the, the, the places where it stops. You see? And these are called crucifixions. The sun crossifies or crosses over. Because these are the four markers, the cardinal point. Okay? Now, what I'm going to do is bring this back around here, this circle, so that we have now a circle to deal with. So, the Sun now, there's Libra, there's Scorpio, there's Sagittarius, and this is the, the, the sign that we're dealing with, Capricorn. The Sun is right here now, it's only about a week away from the solstice, and then you wait three days and then it starts here, starts off on the 25th and then over here we have New Year's Day, January the 1st and then over here, January the 4th, we have Perihelion. Peri meaning closest to the closest to Helios is the Sun closest to the Sun so here on January the 4th is perihelion right at this point which is opposite July the 4th, right at this point here, the Earth is closest to the Sun. In fact, it's about 4 million miles closer than when the Sun is over here at Apo, Apohelion. Okay? Apo in Greek, Apo means away from. Peri means closest to. You see? And another word that describes this is perigee and apogee. Perigee, apogee, closest to, furthest away. So these all happen in the sign of Capricorn. And what is it that happens in the sign of Capricorn? Well, the nativity scene. And um, this is how it happens. So when the sun finally comes down in autumn, goes through Scorpio in November, and then Sagittarius in December, this is where we are now, December the 13th, the sun hits the shortest day of the year. Now, so from this point on, you can go out confidently between 12 midnight and 2 a.m., uh, and the reason I'm saying all the way to 2 a.m. is because we've had 2,000 years of pro processional slippage. Now, processional slippage means that the stars, the stars have fallen back out of, out of kilter with this original um, blueprint for the skies. This is the original, the one and only original. Okay, but what's happened is instead of uh, we're this is Aries, we are now in the age of Pisces entering Aquarius so the position of the stars in the last 2000 years have moved, have slipped 30 degrees, you see so when you go out at midnight it might be best to wait till 1am to see the configuration that I'm about to show you okay now so this is what happens um, when the sun hits this point, it's considered to be dead because this is winter and everything is in a state of coma and death. There's snow on the ground, there's no leaves on the trees, there's no fruits, no harvest. Harvest happens here. So this is all where you collect the harvest and you make your wine in Libra and then you put it in your pantry because you wait for the winter. And here, this is the 
the finishing line of the sun. The sun dies on the 21st. So, and it gets it gets a an arrow, the, Sag the arrow of Sagittarius. It gets it in the heel. This is where Hercules and Achilles gets it in the heel, and where Jesus gets a nail on the foot, in the heel. You see, because this is the heel. This is hell, the lowest point. And it's it's a cruel. It's symbolically, it's a very very cruel time for the sun. Because the sun is considered to be an infant, since <clears throat> since when you observe the sun in winter, the rays are very very um, very uh, short, and the sun is small. It's actually physically smaller in winter than it is in summer. And in summer, when the, when the sun climbs up through the Equinox up to the Tropic of Cancer. This is the Tropic of Cancer, and it hits the sign of Cancer. Here, the sun is in its glory, you see, and it's radiant. But here, it's a little baby. So, this is why they wait three days, and then on the 25th of December, they celebrate the birthday of the sun. Now, one of the church fathers, Cyprian, was um, quoted, wonderful that our Lord should make the birthday of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, the same as the birthday of the Son. In fact, this day was always called in Latin, the day of the unconquered Son, because even though the Son dies at the solstice, he continues on his journey and to conquer. So he is unconquered. And that particular day the Romans called Dies Invictus Solis Natis. The day, the birthday of the unconquered sun. And there it is. Christmas Day. Just around the corner, guys. And this is what you will see when you look up to the skies. At midnight, on this particular day here, you look directly above your head and you'll see the brightest star in the sky. Sirius. There she is in all her glory. And not too far from Sirius is Taurus. And Taurus, the belt of Orion, seemed to be pointing like this, directly to Sirius. Now, and of course, all the planets and all the orbs in the sky rise in the east like the stars and set in the west so this is why the gospel says that the three wise men bringing gifts for the sun follow the star in the east because he comes from the east and then like clockwork at midnight there she is Isis Sirius directly above the head and the gospel says that the uh, three wise men followed the star in the east until it uh, stood over the manger where the child is born well the manger is here in cancer in cancer there's a little in the middle of the sign of cancer there's a little box of four stars like that and um, and there's a little cluster of stars and that's called the manger and there it is right next to Sirius over here in Cancer the manger is right there and these two stars that flank it one is called the southern donkey and one is called the northern donkey um, Asinellus borealis and Asinellus Australis. And this manger is, you can see it in the sky. If you can identify it, it's very faint, but you should be able to see it on a clear night. And there it is. You see, so when the sun is born on the 25th of December, the three wise men follow the star in the east to the manger, and the star hovers over the manger, directly above where the sun is born. 
Now, as I said before, at this particular moment, at midnight, you will see rising in the east is Virgo and setting in the west is Aries, the Lamb of God. And Virgo is the virgin that presides over, she is the same virgin as this virgin, because Isis is the virgin mother of our sun, you see. And this is why there is always a star above Mary's head, Mary, Isis Mary. Because she is in fact, scientists, occult scientists know that uh, many millions of years ago, this star Sirius ejected our star, our sun, from its equatorial belt and um, has always been in a dual binary system with our star. So she is physically, truly, in fact, the mother of our star. And this one is Isis, Sirius, and this one is called Jesus, because J-E-S, or Y-E-S, is the name of the sun, yes, you see. So there she is on Christmas Day, and she's calling her son, she's calling him to climb back up to be with her. And finally, when the sun does join Sirius in the sign of Cancer, and Sirius conjuncts the sun around about Oh, uh, around about here, around about July the, f um, sorry, that's June the 21st, July the 4th is over here, sorry, I put July 4th over there, my apologies, um, opposite January the 4th is July the 4th, okay, so, So, and July the 4th is Apohelion Day. So when the sun finally goes to its mother in Cancer, Gemini in Cancer, and they conjunct, the, the dog days begin, you see? There's three weeks of very, very hot weather. Because now Jesus is with his mother, and they're conjuncting. So she calls him on that particular day, on the 25th of December, to climb back up. Now the Gospels tell very clearly that there are shepherds outdoor, outdoors and tending their flocks on uh, Christmas Eve. Well, in the constellation of Capricorn, there are two stars. One is called... <clears throat> Erae, and one is called... Al Firk. This is the flock, this is the shepherd. And they are always in Capricorn. You see, this is why there are three wise men who follow the star in the east until it hovers above the manger where the child is born, Jesus is born, on the 25th of December at the early hours just between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day at midnight, that is the moment in which um, the sun begins to journey from the solstice, to climb back up to its mother, Sirius, in Cancer. Now, so these are basically all of the stars that you will see, and they're not hard to find, okay? You can go out at night and you will find these stars. It's quite easy. Um, because these stars are very bright, you see, and they make up the three stars in the saucepan, as I showed before. Okay? Uh, so there's the three wise men, and there's the, br the, the, the star that they follow from the east, and in the nativity scene, you will always see certain animals. You will see uh, a goat. You might see a lamb, a cow, a horse, or, or um, a donkey. Now, those animals are animals of the zodiac. So they're telling you that Jesus is always with the animals of the zodiac when he's born. 
When he is born, and in particular, uh, predominantly you'll see donkeys. And they are the donkeys. Remember the two donkeys of the manger. He's always surrounded by donkeys, or lambs, or bulls, or cows, rather, or horses, or goats. There's the horses and the goats, and usually you'll see a goat and a horse in the manger, and, and a donkey or two. Well, these, that's what it's showing, okay? Now, in, in the constellation of Cancer, there is a there is a constellation, it's a massive constellation and it's called um, Argo and it's, in, it's one of the deacons so Cancer, every sign has three other constellations in there okay and Cancer has Argo and Ursa Major and Ursa Minor now Argo Argo is Jason's ship, Jason and the Argonauts. It's also Noah's Ark. Um, and why is it Noah's Ark? Well, quite simply because Noah brought animals into the Ark two by two. And everywhere here in these two constellations, there are four sets of twins. First of all, there are the twins of Gemini. Secondly, there are the twins of the dogs, Canis Major and Canis Menor are in uh, Gemini and over here you have Ursa Major and Ursa Minor and you have Asinellus Borealis and Asinellus Australis and that's four sets of twins that Noah brings into his ark on top of Mount Ararat this is Mount Ararat and there's Noah collecting the animals two by two into his ark but Jason Jason on the other hand he puts 50 oarsmen, 50 oarsmen in his boat. Now I wonder why. Well, simply because Sirius here is not alone. She is, there's a star that orbits Sirius and that's called Sirius B. Now Sirius B is the boss of the whole system, you see. He takes 49.9 years to orbit Sirius A. Now Sirius B is also called Osiris and he is the companion of Isis. But he is a dark lord, you see, because you can't see Sirius B. And he's a dark lord and a heavy star because in fact he is heavy. They called this one the star. And that's because a hieroglyph for Osiris is always a throne and an eye. Because Osiris is Sirius B. And in fact he is he is the Sir. Yes, sir, because sir is short for Sirius. And the 49, or rather the 50 years that he takes to orbit Sirius are the 50 oarsmen in the constellation of Argo. Because, you see, these stars drive the whole system. And in particular, this fellow here, because he is a very powerful star, in fact... Every time, uh, every time Sirius B comes between our star and Sirius A, uh, our Earth slows down in its orbit and speeds up. Scientists have noticed this. It happened last in 1989. So this star here is directly influencing our solar system. That's why he's the boss. In fact, Sirius is the um, the dog star. Yes, sir, he's the boss, and especially will you will you notice the dog star 
um, in the season of Capricorn. You see, so it's it's very very ben beneficial. You have two months to do this, so don't panic if Christmas Day comes along and there's clouds. <laughs> don't worry, you know, just give yourself a break. And there's <laughs> there's two months to watch this. You'll you'll see it. You know, it won't be. It won't be directly above your head for forever, but you will you'll see you'll get the drift. You will understand all of this. Uh, now, Sirius B is considered to be the I star, the heavy star, and why would that be? Well, because Sirius B is a carbon star, unlike our hydrogen star. It's made of carbon and it's very dense. In fact, it's 300 times harder than a diamond, harder than diamond. Uh, on the surface and 3,000 times harder in its core. So, and he spins, he rotates 23 times every minute on its axis, producing one of the most powerful mag magnetic fields known to man. In fact, there's always a storm of electricity between the two stars. It is so powerful, the amount of discharge of electricity and magnetism is absolutely astonishing between these two lover stars. And ac actually, rather than we being in a binary with these stars, we are in a trinary or a ternary, you see? And this is the eye. It's the brightest star of the sky, and it's the eye of the whole system and it's always at the top of the pyramid you see if you turn this into a pyramid the eye is always here Isis is there she is at the top and she is the mother and she has her companion Osiris and he takes 50 years to drive his electricity around her impregnating one another and of course the motor to Argo the ship that goes around with the animals of Noah's Ark. Excuse me. Now, if you think that's pretty good, I mean, there's, there's plenty, plenty more. I mean, I'm only scratching the surface. What I would like to do is take you through this quadrant here starting from the 21st of December and finishing with the 21st of March this quadrant is the best for astrotheology and um, what we have here in this 90 degrees we've already d discussed uh, this particular alignment with Sirius and our Sun Mother Mary pulling Jesus back up to herself so that they can be conjuncted and you know what conjunction means don't you when stars conjunct they um, okay they're having sex they conjugate, conjunction. Uh, sorry, I think I've, <laughs> I've made a big mistake there, haven't I? Con. Is that right? Anyway, someone please uh, correct me. Uh, I'll probably have the wrong spelling for conjugate, but a conjunction is when two stars or two planetary orbs in the zodiac come together. Yeah, conjunction. Thanks for that. Hey, William, how are you? Uh, yeah, <laughs> the Dogon tribe. Now, interesting that uh, the Bozo and the Dogon tribe in, um, in Mali, Central Africa, Central Northern Africa, are aware of this, um, this star even though it's invisible. Now, why would they be aware of that star? Well, obviously, because thousands of years ago, when mankind was much more conscious and aware of this beautiful science, 
um, they were instructed in the nature, the true nature of the stars and all of the visible bodies that are closest to us, you see. So this tribe inherited this beautiful wisdom and knew about this star. In fact, the Mali tribe, the Dogon tribe, and by the way, Dogon is spelt with a dog on it, coincidentally. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Uh, the dog star, Sirius. Um, every 50 years, just like a jubilee, the, um, the Mali tribe have a celebration in honour of Sirius B. And they call it the heavy star, you see? And because of its heaviness, it's like, uh, you know, like a dynamo. It, um, it affects our solar system. Now, the next, the next date, here we have the 25th of December, the next date would be the 1st of January. It's eight days, eight days of, of um, journeying. Now, the Jews have, a, have a, um, a requirement for every male to be circumcised on the eighth day. Well, the 1st of January, coincidentally, in the liturgical Christian calendar, is called Circumcision Day. Well, New Year's Day. Why would New Year's Eve and New Year's Day uh, be associated with uh, circumcision? Well, if the sun is born on the 25th of December and you count eight days, you get to the, 20, you get to the 1st of January, don't you? And there, the year and the word year Year comes from year, 